we will all experience a headache at some point in our lives. In fact, more people report suffering headaches than any other medical condition. Some headaches are painful and debilitating, and some are mild. But even the mildest headache is hard to ignore. But imagine a headache so severe, it feels like your head will explode. Or that someone is repeatedly stabbing you in the eye. Pain so intense, you feel nauseated and have to vomit. A headache so strong that you have to seek complete darkness because you become unbearably sensitive to light. And imagine this torture goes on for hours and hours, even days, stopping you from doing anything other than suffering through it. This is what it's like to experience a migraine. We're about to take a closer look at this serious neurological disorder, one of the most common illnesses in the world, affecting one in seven people, or more than one billion people across the globe. When you hear the term migraine, unless you suffer from the disorder yourself, you'll most likely think of a headache. And although a headache is largely considered the main symptom, migraines often produce a variety of other symptoms as well. Migraine is a recurrent disorder characterized most prominently by pain, but also nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to light and sound that can last anywhere from hours to 72 hours. Migraine is not a life-threatening life disorder, but it can be very disabling and very disruptive and affect the quality of life for patients and their families. Migraine is most consistently present in people between the ages of 18 and 44, but it often goes undiagnosed in children. About 10% of school-aged children and nearly a third of young people between the ages of 15 to 19 suffer from migraine. For decades, scientists have known that migraine attacks affect three times more women than men. And recent research has shown that women also suffer more severe and disabling episodes than men. But the reasons for this are still unclear. Migraine is uh, very much a female disorder. Migraine is very often menstrual, so it, uh, attacks occur during menstruation. But we should never forget that each patient is different. So we need to understand the mechanisms of migraine. And then if we can do that and understand what's going on, that would also point to how to develop a new medicine. The consequences of migraine are considerable. On average, people with migraine suffer as many as 13 attacks a year. But some can suffer many more. And although the extent and severity of a migraine is painfully clear to them, it is still widely misunderstood by others. So what actually happens during a migraine attack? And how does it evolve? Let's take a closer look. Typically, we stage migraine and refer to the beginning the premonitory, sometimes called prodromal phase, the headache phase, and then the phase after the headache, the postdrome. In between the premonitory phase and the headache, one has the aura phase. In the premonitory phase, a range of remarkable symptoms occur. Brain fog, a, a slight neck uh, stiffness. Many patients will say that they feel fatigued. They'll say they're sleepy or they'll crave sweet or savoury things, and some get a little moody. While the premonitory, or warning phase, is common, the second phase, the aura, is only experienced by a smaller group of patients. About 20 to 25% of patients towards the end of that premonitory phase will have the aura phase, very widely recognised, sparkly, jagged lines that appear in the periphery of the vision and enlarge, leaving behind it a loss of vision, which we call a scotoma. These evolve and meld into the headache phase. 
Some who experience aura in connection with migraines also develop other and more severe symptoms. Some people can have sensory symptoms, and this will typically start as a tingling in one or two fingers, spreading through the other fingers up the arm. And then some people have speech problems where they can't express themselves, they can't find the right words. And a small group of patients, on top of these other symptoms, they can be paralyzed in one side of the body. The third stage of a migraine attack is the most commonly known, the headache phase. The headache phase is typically about, in about two thirds of patients on one side of the head. It's associated with light sensitivity, photophobia, sound sensitivity, phonophobia, and sensitivity to smells, osmophobia. Typically the pain will be throbbing and ordinary movement, shaking the head, walking up a flight of stairs will make the pain worse. The fourth and final stage, the postdrome, occurs after the headache ends. This is sometimes referred to as the migraine hangover, and this phase can be just as debilitating as the headache phase preceding it. Many patients, perhaps 80%, will have a postdrome and the most typical symptom they'll have is a dreadful sense of weariness, as though their batteries are completely flat. The entire experience can be very disabling for them. Migraine has severe effects on the everyday lives of people suffering from this complex disorder. On top of the physical symptoms, they're also more likely to experience mental health issues like stress, anger, sleeping difficulties, anxiety, and depression. In a recent global study of disease burden among migraine patients, more than 90% of people with migraine reported being unable to work or function normally during an attack. And children with migraine miss school twice as often as their classmates. It's very important to say that migraine is much more than just a headache, whatever just a headache is when, when people say it. So migraine can be very severe, the pain can be utterly disabling. The World Health Organization thinks that a day with migraine can be as bad as a day quadriplegic because of the the disability, the um, inability to function normally in life. And of course, on top of the headache are the many other symptoms, which can be very, very debilitating. For some, the migraine attacks become more frequent over time, eventually becoming a chronic disorder. An estimated 148 million people worldwide are suffering from chronic migraine. A lot of patients, they tell us that Okay, for a long time I have had my attacks, perhaps uh, now and then, or mostly once a month. But this evolves to be more and more frequent, and sometimes it even goes to be a chronic migraine, which is defined by the patient are affected by their migraine headache more than 15 days a month. And that is terrible, it has a very severe impact on their life. Twenty-six-year-old Melina knows all too well what life is like with chronic migraine. Since early childhood, migraine has been an unwelcome but familiar companion, and increasingly so. Første migraine anfald husker jeg tydeligt fra jeg var seks år. For seks år siden til jeg var 13 år, der har jeg migræne i de der tre til fem gange på en måned i de der tre dages varighed. Men øh, da jeg bliver teenager, så, så stikker det jo helt af fra, fra de der tre fem gange til de der 15 plus dage om måneden af tre dages varighed. Lige nu der har jeg 15 til 20 gange græne om måneden med en til tre dages varighed. Og øh, på, på sådan en hel måned der har jeg Ja, ikke en helt normal dag. Jeg har altid et eller andet. Jeg har altid hovedpine på en eller anden måde. Det er ekstremt frustrerende. Ekstremt frustrerende, at jeg ikke kan få lov til at gøre ting, jeg har lyst til. At jeg altid skal planlægge rundt om min migræne. Altid gå og frygte for at få migræne. Det er enormt svært for mig at, at håndtere aftaler og familiebegivenheder. Og og så når man går ud og spise, tage i biografen, alle de her sådan normale, hyggelige ting. Ikke? Migræne, det har jo 
blandt andet gjort, at jeg måtte droppe ud af mit, mit drømmestudie, <laughs> mit studie. Det har gjort, at jeg har mistet fuldtidsarbejde, og det har bare gjort, at jeg er ude af stand til at altså, lave andet end at mærke migræne, altså at ligge derhjemme. Det er enormt ensomt og enormt isolerende. Jeg har min familie, og så har jeg ikke nogen øh, tætte venner, jeg ser fast med overhovedet. Unfortunately for Malina, and for so many others, it was until recently unclear exactly what causes migraine attacks, even though the disorder has been known and studied for thousands of years. Migraine is in fact one of the oldest ailments known to mankind. Some of the earliest cases were recorded by the ancient Egyptians, and they date back as far as 1200 BC. The Greek physician Hippocrates, often referred to as the father of medicine, wrote about the visual disturbances that can precede a migraine, the aura. Although studies of the disorder can be dated far back, even up to a few decades ago, there was still widespread misconception about migraine. Our understanding of migraine in the 1970s was very primitive. Migraine was often dismissed as a disorder because there wasn't a definitive test that you could do to make the diagnosis. And even there was uncertainty whether migraine was anything more than a psychiatric disease, which I think was the cruelest cut of all. The general lack of understanding about this disorder wasn't the only problem migraine patients had to face. The attitude towards the patients themselves was also hard to deal with. Almost all the doctors were male, and the general conception was that migraine is just a headache and uh, it's uh, mostly women and uh, maybe some feeling that, you know, they exaggerated their attacks so they could avoid doing their housework. People thought it was more or less some partly hysterical or neurotic uh, disorder, so it was really not accepted at all. Despite this lack of acknowledgement, the 1970s proved to be a decade with significant developments in migraine research. Realizing that in order to treat migraine attacks, they needed first to know what caused them, a small group of scientists began taking serious interest in the underlying mechanisms of migraine attacks. The migraine field at that time was very focused on, on blood vessels, and the treatment was woefully inadequate. It was basically ergots, and patients often were not satisfactorily treated by the ergotamine. And it drove me to ask about what's the neuroanatomy known about pain, what the relationship was between blood vessels and pain. But rather than focusing on the blood vessel, I chose to study the trigeminal nerve, which is the major sensory nerve that conveys pain and other sensations from the face and, and from the scalp, as well as from the skull. In the early 1980s, the American neuroscientist Michael Moskowitz discovered a link between the trigeminal nerve and the blood vessels in the meninges, three membrane layers that cover and protect our brain and spinal cord, and the only structure inside the skull that senses pain. Moskowitz knew that the trigeminal nerve fibers were wrapped around blood vessels in the meninges. And he suspected that neuropeptides, small proteins that act as signaling molecules released from the trigeminal nerve, were dilating blood vessels and thereby causing pain. In Sweden, neuroscientist Lars Edvinson had also become interested in these neuropeptides, one in particular known as calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP. Over time, Edvinson joined forces with another neuroscientist, Peter Goldsby, and they soon made some crucial discoveries. The CGRP nerves to the intracranial vasculature comes from the trigeminal ganglion, and it goes to different parts uh, of the head. I mean, it goes to the, the teeth, the alveolar, to the nose, all the glands, to the eye, the skin, everything of the head. And these fibers, they originate in the trigeminal ganglion, so that's the sensory fibers. If these trigeminal fibers are activated, they release CGRP and perhaps other transmitters onto the blood vessels, causing 
these uh, small vessels on the side where it's activity to, to uh, widen a bit. And that causes a pulsation. Edvinson and Goldsby showed that CGRP was released from the trigeminal nerve during a migraine attack. But was the release of CGRP from the trigeminal nerve the cause or a consequence of a migraine attack? This question was answered nearby in Denmark, where neuroscientist Jess Olsen was following the work of Goldsby and Evanson very closely. We collaborated and uh, studied human blood vessels, and that led actually to our study of CGRP, where we gave it to patients and showed that it could induce a migraine attack in migraine sufferers. And uh, after that, it was pretty obvious what the target was. The target was to counteract, to antagonize CGRP. Proving that the release of neuropeptides, such as CGRP, from the trigeminal nerve could in fact cause a migraine attack was a major breakthrough for the scientists. And although it became clear that CGRP is not the only neuropeptide that can cause migraine attacks, Knowledge of CGRP's role identified it as a target for developing much-needed new treatments. In this trigeminal vascular system, there are many different signaling molecules, and several of them can uh, dilate, open up uh, blood vessels. Which ones of those would be interesting in migraine and which ones would not? That was a difficult uh, question to answer. And when we could show that CTRP infusion can induce a migraine attack, it it's, it's almost goes without saying that an antagonist would be effective in treating a migraine attack. So our work, I think, was crucial for the industry to have enough confidence to develop these uh, CTRP antagonistic uh, treatments. So far, no treatment has proved helpful to Melina, who still suffers frequent and debilitatingly painful attacks. When I have migraine, so I stay in a very, very dark room where there is completely still. I stay completely still, so I stand up. Oh, I can't believe that there is just something that is so unbearable. It makes me so ill in my head. I can't anymore. That I can't open my eyes. That I can't open my mouth. Det føles som om, der er en eller anden, der slår mig med et bat, eller at der er en, der bruger mig i hovedet, eller slår mig med en hammer. Og jeg har bare vandet af mine øjne på grund af smerte. Når jeg har en så stærke, voldsomme smerte, det eneste, jeg kan tænke på, det er, hvordan får jeg det til at stoppe? Hvad, 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 hvad kan jeg gøre? Ikke? Kan jeg, altså, hvad kan jeg gøre? Kan jeg smadre mit hoved ind i væggen for at få det til at stoppe? Kan jeg, kan, hvad kan jeg gøre? Altså, du ved, kan jeg tage en hammer og slå mig selv? Altså, og, og, og man mister fuldstændig kontrollen over tanker, over krop, over det hele. Man vil bare gerne af med de her smerter. Og man kan jo ikke, jeg kan jo ikke gøre noget, for fysisk ligger jeg bare stille. Det er så hårdt at bare kæmpe sig igennem sådan en dag, hvor at dage, flere dage, alle, det, altså... Bare det her med nu, er jeg virkelig svært ved at sidde og koncentrere mig om, at skal fortælle om det. Det har overtaget mit liv og gjort, at jeg er sygemeldt. Jeg føler bare, at jeg sidder fast. Hvordan skal, jeg, hvordan skal jeg få en fremtid? Hvordan kan jeg arbejde? Hvordan kan jeg gå i skole? Hvordan kan jeg have en familie? Hvordan kan jeg overhovedet noget øh, have et liv i det hele taget, når, når det er så voldsomt? Og jeg hedder og græder, jeg græder ikke, fordi jeg det trigger min migræne for sindssygt. Det er så latterligt. Så jeg prøver altså at kæmpe så meget for at holde det inden, fordi jeg får så hundt i hovedet, og jeg græder det sådan åndssvagt. Although life with migraine is still tough for Melina, there is renewed hope for her and the many other patients who so desperately want to live without the disorder. This hope comes in the shape of new types of medicine that target CGRP or its receptor on blood vessels. In the treatment of migraine, it's very important to distinguish very clearly between the attack treatment and the prophylactic treatment. This is only given to patients who have frequent attacks. Because CGRP is a peptide, 
it can bind antibodies. There are three available for patients now that bind the CGRP molecule. So if it's bound, it can't work. So that's a way of antagonizing CGRP. A force one binds to the receptor. And uh, when the receptor is, is bound by this antibody, CGRP itself cannot get into the receptor and cannot work. While there have been breakthroughs and new treatments to ease the symptoms of a migraine attack, we still don't know what actually causes the disease itself. If you want to stop something, it's useful to understand how it starts. If you could understand the earliest part of an attack, if you could understand the beginning, if you could understand the biology of that, you have a sporting chance of improving therapies. And it might sound a bit crazy, but maybe one, one day if you understood enough about how it started, you'd be able to develop a cure to stop it altogether. The answer to the question of what causes migraine the disease might, at least in part, be found in our genes. What we really want to know is what are the basic, basic mechanisms of migraine? Can we interact in future so that people don't get migraine at all? We know already that 50% of the reason is genetic, so people have a genetic disposition. But what is this? We need to get it characterized. And what is the other 50% of the risk? So more questions need to be answered if we're to gain a more thorough insight into what causes migraine the disease. Like why do more women than men suffer from migraine? Hormones may play in, and that's our current challenge. Oestrogen, of course, is produced in the ovaries, but we find the receptors of oestrogen in the trigeminal ganglion located very differently in cells containing these uh, CGRP and CGRP receptors. So the hormones can modify the signaling in this pain regulator. It Maybe it's uh, the tuner of pain, so it, you can turn it up or down a bit uh, and the hormones can modify the tuning in the system. I think this is a completely new avenue in understanding of migraine pain. The new treatments that block the action of CGRP and prevent migraine attacks are a major breakthrough for people like Melina. But questions remain. Do the CGRP treatments work for every migraine sufferer? And how close are we to finding a cure for migraine and helping the one billion people suffering from this disease? What's happening at the moment is the beginning of an era when this disorder is really going to be interrogated in a way that's going to benefit patients. There are more techniques being applied to the problem and therapies are resulting from that. So there is light at the end of a very dark tunnel for the many people who have the problem. For Melina and countless others, a breakthrough would be life-changing. Melina was recently allowed to take part in trials of one of the newest treatments. And that has sparked hope for a better life. It would mean a lot for me if my migraine was more limited or disappeared. It would make me in order to get my life back. And then I press it good in here. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. So I come and stick here. I would like to get some of the daily things that I couldn't get before. So there. Yeah. Og så kan du se, at der er sådan en lille klar druppe med en lille smule medicin, og nu kommer der også en lille smule blod. Altså det er fuldstændig normalt med det her. Jeg okay. får lov til at nyde og tage ud og spise en middag, kunne rejse og altså stå op om morgenen og få, få lov til at gå ud for døren og bare gøre lige det, jeg vil. Yes. Tak for hjælpen. Så, det har været, det har været godt. Og måske ikke lade være med at gå og være så bange hele tiden. Så jeg ja. håber, du har gode nyheder med til mig næste gang? Ja, det håber jeg også. Yes. <laughs> Min største drøm, det er at kunne få lov at drømme. Jeg har det rigtig godt i dag. Jeg har det liv, som jeg ikke tog drømme om. Jeg har været ude at rejse, og jeg har, har en normal hverdag, hvor jeg kan gå i skole. Det har jo gjort, at jeg oplever det, som nok er det allerstørste for mig, der er sket. Og det er, at jeg har sluppet for frygten for at få min grene.